we're back. Now that we're familiar with the basic concepts of the game, let's cover a round of play using our brand new production time saving <laughs> On your turn, you get two actions, and each of those actions can be one of five things. Build a tile, build a link, sell cotton, develop, or take a loan. All these actions require you to play a card, but the only time the card matters is when building a tile. Let's start there. Red wants to build a coal mine in Blackburn. The easiest way to do that is to play a card with that city on it. The other way is to play an industry card matching the tile he wants to build. In order to do that though, the city he wants to build in has to either have one of his tiles in it or be connected by his links to a city with one of his tiles in it. As a last resort, he can use up both of his actions and play any two cards to build anywhere he wants on the board. He plays a Blackburn card, pays the money for the mine, places the tile in the city, and populates it with coal. Red also wants to build a link between two cities. In the first half of the game, canals are used for links, and in the second half, rails are used. Canals cost three monies each, and rails cost five, plus a coal cube. However, if you're willing to pay extra, you can build a second rail during the same action, but rather than five more monies, it'll cost you ten, for a total of fifteen. Expensive, but sometimes worth it. When building a canal or rail, it ultimately has to lead to a city with one of your tiles in it. Red plays a card to perform the action, and the turn passes to green. Green's turn is up, and she plays a cotton mill card to build one in Manchester. For her second action, she plays a card in order to sell cotton. She has a total of two cotton mills connected to a port, and decides to sell from the first mill to the distant market. She flips the market tile and drops the demand marker down the listed amount. The market hasn't hit the bottom space yet, so she's safe. If she were to draw the wrong tile, the demand could hit bottom, and her selling action would be over, and nobody would be able to sell to the distant market for the rest of the period. She flips her cotton mill and moves on to her second mill. For that mill, she decides to sell to her own port, since the market is a bit closer to the bottom than she would like. When selling to any player's port tile, the mill and the port get flipped, with each tile's owning player moving up the appropriate amount on the income track. Yellow is up now and decides to build an iron mill first. He plays a card, pays the cost, and puts down the tile. A level 1 iron mill requires a coal cube to build, so Yellow takes one from Red's coal mine. Yellow puts four iron cubes on his new iron mill and moves to his next action, which is to develop his industries. This is something we haven't covered yet, but it's pretty simple. The industry tiles are sorted into stacks of the same type, with the lowest numbered tiles on top. Tiles are built on the board from the top down, so if you want to get to the more advanced tiles without building them, you have to develop them. Yellow plays a card and takes one iron from the board and discards the top tile from one of his five stacks. The option to take a second iron cube and develop one of his stacks again is open to him, which he takes. We're striving for efficiency here. Finally, Purple is up and has a revelation that her cash flow is weak, so she decides to play a card to take a loan. To learn about loans, let's look at the Income slash Victory Point track. Even though they're on the same track, income and points have little to do with each other. As you've seen, whenever a tile is flipped, the owning player moves their wafer disc thing up the track the appropriate number of spaces. At the top of every round, players receive an income based on the location of their disc. The track is chopped up into alternating colored sections. When a player takes a loan, they move their disc down the track to the next colored band and take 10 monies from the bank. They can do this up to three times in one action for a total of 30 monies. Purple does just that, moving back three spaces for 30 monies. For her second action, she uses this newfound wealth to construct a port with the hopes that someone will use it to sell cotton through, now that the demand marker is so low. Hopefully that'll pan out. With the round over, we look at the money spent area of the board. The turn order is adjusted based on who spent the least to the most in the last round. Players refill their hands back to eight cards, and the game continues until the deck is exhausted and players are out of cards. At that point, the current period is over. The game has two halves, the canal period and the rail period. Canals and tiles with a canal on them can only be built in the canal period, and the same thing applies to rails and tiles with rails. Scoring happens at the end of the canal and the rail periods. Flipped tiles are worth their listed points, and links score points based on the number of gold circles on each side. 
After the canal period, the board is wiped of all flipped tiles and unflipped level 1 tiles. In the rail period, restrictions are tightened on what can be built. If you're behind on the technology curve when that happens, then you've got a lot of developing to do. Also, cities in the rail period can hold more than one tile per player. And with that, we leave them to their game. I love this game. Everything fits together in this nice little circle of life. Mills need ports, better mills need coal, coal mines need iron, iron mines need coal, but most importantly, players need each other to succeed. It's all about building little parasitic relationships where people need to help you in order to help themselves. You're always watching to see who's using your stuff, which keeps you engaged during the game. It's awesome. These plastic coins suck. They're difficult to pick up and just don't feel very fun. I mean, I appreciate the thought since anything is better than paper money, but I would have rather had they used cardboard chits over this. Instead, I use poker chips since they pick up and stack much easier. I recommend everyone go to their local thrift store and get a set. Mine cost 13 bucks and they're great. Also, this is by far the rules heaviest game I've reviewed here. <coughs> what the? You again? <laughs> Kalis is by, is by far, far the, the most, most involved, involved game, rules-wise, that I've reviewed to date. Yeah, so I'm overruling that. Kalis' rulebook makes a modicum of sense, whereas this game practically flaunts its obtuseness by making you read the rules twice. I can't even guarantee that I don't have a rule or two screwed up somewhere. Lots of people have taken a crack at condensing the rules into an easily digestible format, and I suggest you look that stuff up. At the very least, you should watch a video about the game. Your mileage may vary, but this game is published by Fred Games, which, as I understand it, was involved in a sort of vertical price-fixing situation. They forced retailers to sell their games at a certain price, which is well above what most of us are used to paying at certain places for these types of games. From what I can tell, though, that practice seems to have gone by the wayside, but some places are still charging a considerable amount more than others. If you're like me, then make sure you do your research before buying if you're at all concerned about that kind of thing. Let's just put it all on the table. If you can get it for a good price, or spend your time walking around in suits made of money, and are at all interested in Euro-style gaming, then you owe it to yourself to at least check this game out. Bring a respirator to a local board gaming convention and find someone who knows how to play it if you feel like you still need to know more. But this one is a definite keeper for me.